And we will be going immediately into the word found in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And it reads as follows. Unto the angels of the church of Ephesus, write, these things said he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your work, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how canest not bear them which are evil, and how hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found their lives and has bored and has patient and for the sake and for my name's sake had labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, uh, somewhat against you because thou had left thy first love. Remember therefore where thou art falling and repent and do the first work or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will remove thy candlestick out of the place except thou repent. But thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolonians, which had all, which I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I come to eat, will, I, <clears throat> will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise of God. May God add a blessing upon the reading of his word. Uh, I would like to speak to you from the subject of the dangers of a complacent church. The dangers of a complacent church. As we take time to look where we are and what we are dealing with in this year 2020 as we take time to focus not with our physical eyes but with our spiritual eyes uh, we will come to the realization to understand that uh, we as the people of God are not where we should be uh, we seem like we have lost our way we seem like we're not doing the things we should be uh, we seem like we have fallen to the same problem of the Israelite when in the Old Testament, that God had blessed them and brought them through, and they get to a place of complacency. They get to a place where they will leave the Almighty God after all that He have done for them. They will forget and start serving and worshiping idol gods. We find them also wanting to do the things what other uh, nation was doing. Israel was led by God, but they wanted a leader, and God gave them judges first, and later on, he allowed them to have kings under his permissive will. And I know you have heard me use that term, permissive will, and his, his perfect will. God has a perfect will for everyone, but sometime in our lives, he has he have exercised his permissive will. His perfect will is the perfect plan that he has for our life, that if we are faithful and walk, and walk according to his blessing, to his instruction, then things will work out the way it's supposed to be. But sometimes, just like little children, we find ourselves want to try little things and want to do little things. And sometimes we will go to our parents because we think we're big enough and think that the child is old enough, the child will go ask to do something. Sometimes the parent will allow them to do that in order to teach them a lesson about, through experience that the things they thought was right for them was not right. And God sometimes allows through his permissive will to uh, experience a thing or to let us recognize that we had the best thing, on, we had the better thing in the first place. Uh, they wanted kings and they had God to lead them and God allowed them to have kings. And, and we find that they start off with some good kings and they had some bad kings and pretty soon the nation was destroyed because they lost their their relationship with God. Well, when we get to the book of Revelation, we find that uh, um, we are, are falling in some of the same predicament. When we get to the end of the book, when we look where we are right now, we find that we are falling in the same trap. Uh, uh, some may ask the question, where's the church? Uh, 
when there are social injustice going on. Someone may ask, where's the church? Uh, why COVID is wrapping through the line through the uh, through the land? Some may ask, where's the church? When people are suffering and at home by themselves and their mind begin to play them, where's the church when there's unemployment and it seems like there's no money coming in? Where's the church when there's no food on the table? Where is the church? when there's ministry that need to be done and it seems like we cannot find the church. And the fun and the ironic things that we find that we'll see is sometimes we hear the people that are asking where are the church. There are members of a church. Uh, they have professed to be baptized, born believers, and but yet they are asking where is the church in all that's going on. And the truth of the matter that if you are asking the question and you are of Christ, then you are the church within yourself. That God has given us a responsibility to be a temple within our own self. So therefore, we have the church as an individual, but also we have a church that collected and as a church individual began to do what God had called him to do within his his perfect plan, then we will find that the church as a whole will be able to do what it needs to do as we collectively come together as God work things out for the good. Uh, as a collective body of the church, we are all called to minister. We are all called to speak the word. We are all called to meet the needs of, of the poor. We are all called to be there in diverse time. We all have different platforms. Some may be larger, some may be smaller, but whatever God had called you to do, exercise your gift. The next thing we do, we have to have a love. We have to have a passion because when we know within ourselves that when we have a passion for something, that'll give us encouragement to go on when things get tough. When we have a passion, we have a love, we have a focus, and then we can, we'll be able to have that extra drive when we fear tired and want to give up. That passion will cause us to go on just a little bit further. That passion will make us give more than 100%, give what my coach would call 100%, 110%, that when you are in that situation and you want to give up, when things are pressing you down and seem like the devil is beating you down, you can still keep pressing because you know that at the end, that is a victory. You know at the end, there is salvation. You know at the end, there's a God that's going to come and deliver you and relieve you of that pressure. We see in this particular scripture in the book of Revelation, we find that Paul, I mean, you know, John is exiled on the island of Patmos. And while he is exiled on this island, God began to come to him in a vision. He began to uh, give him the revelation of the, of the end time and began to reveal to him the things that were going on. But when we get to chapter two and three, we find that he began to talk about the seven churches that were prevalent of the day. Yes, those seven churches were doing that day, but the things that the seven churches was dealing with, we are find that we are dealing with the same thing. We find that in those seven churches, we find that there was a church of Ephesus that, as we read in the scripture, they had lost their first love. Uh, the church of Smyrna was the persecuted church. The church of Paragamos that was the compromising church. The church of uh, Thyatira, that was what we call the church that tolerated false doctrine. The church of Sardis was the church of that was lifeless. It was a dead church. The church of Philadelphia was the faithful church. And this church was the one that received a good report. The only church received a good report from the Lord. And then the final church where the church of Laodicea, which was a lukewarm church, a church that played in the middle, didn't want to be righteous or unrighteous, tried to always be in the middle and find that God even said that he would rather that the church be cold or hot because lukewarm water, he would spit it out of his mouth. But let's look at the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus was a good church, a fairly good church, but it did have a problem. And the Lord named that this was a church that, well, it, it, it was a church that stood up and recognized even and recognized the false prophet, recognized those who were speaking 
and say they was of God, but yet they were not. They were teaching false doctrine. They were leading the saints astray. It went on to say that the church did good work, but the church, but they had something lacking in their work. They had something lacking. They said they had lost their first love. Now, it's a danger when you lose your first love because you lose your passion, you lose your drive, and, and therefore you begin to just go through the motion. You begin to come complacent in the state you're in because it's the same old, same old thing. I heard old preacher said that, asked the question, he said, why do you get up in the morning? Why do you go to work? Why do you work all day long? Why do after work you come back home? Why do you sit down and you watch TV? Why do you uh, go to sleep just to wake up to do it all back over and over and over again? Why do you do what you do? Have you ever just taken the time to ask yourself the question, why am I living? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why, why do I keep going over the same thing over and over again? Why do I work? Why do I do? There got to be a deeper meaning than just doing it over and over again. There should be a drive within you to cause you to make you, keep you want to go on a little bit long, keep you focused. And this way, the church at Ephesus, where they were just going through the motion, they were doing the right thing, but they did not have the motivation because they had lost their first world love. Now, in the scripture, he gave us a cure to uh, actually how to find our first love. He told us to go back and start doing what you were doing at first. When I played football, I had a coach. Whenever we had a bad game, he would often tell us, go back to fundamental. We would come back on that, on that Monday, and the first thing we would do, we would go and we would check out our splits. We would make sure the little simple thing, the foundational thing, we would go through and go through over and over again because he was a firm believer that if your foundation were firm, if you had a solid foundation, then, then if you had the fundamentals down, then you had a solid uh, foundation to build your work and build your and run your schemes and run your plan. And this is what God is saying today that He had called us to go back to our foundation. When you study the scripture, you find out the church did not first start out by the early church did not start out by meeting and building. The first church started by meeting in homes. The first thing that happened with COVID 19 that drove us back to our homes that we could, should be teaching God. We should be lifting up and praising God within our homes. Our home should be strong because I learned that when you have strong homes, you have strong churches. If you have strong homes, you have strong community. If you have strong homes, you be a strong youth. If you have strong homes, then you are able to impact a, a nation by simply making sure that the homes are big. But I'm afraid that we fail the test because we start complaining about how bad our kids. We start complaining about, I'm tired of my husband, I'm tired of my wife. We start complaining rather than taking the opportunity to minister to one another. We took the opportunity to point out everything that was wrong with the situation. We start falling for the distraction of COVID-19. We start falling for the distraction of this is the election year. We start falling for the distraction that the economy it seemed to be going bad. But what we should have been doing was putting our faith in God and doing the things that God and going back to our first love to build our passion that we may want to serve God. Yes, church building did close, but the church was still going on. Yes, we weren't able to get up on Sunday morning and go to the house of God. In fact, we could have church every day if we wanted to within our house. Yes, we couldn't be in that one place where the sanctified saints could gather together. But we could be in our sanctified home where our sanctified families come together and begin to pray and lift up the name of Jesus. Yes, we weren't able to come and sing in the choir and usher on the usher board. But yes, we could be at our home and we can have a praise party all we want to. We can pray, pray, we can lift up songs and we can sing, we can listen to songs, we can go on YouTube and go on and lift up videos that we can hear sermons every day of the week if we wanted to because it was available. <coughs> a ministry that we could reach out. Yes, we weren't able to see the saints and be able to touch them, but yes, through modern technology, we were able to call our brothers and sisters and see them face to face and talk to them on FaceTime and, 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 and other uh, uh, media 
outlet that we could reach out and touch them and let them know that, yes, I care, and yeah, I still love you. Yes, in the midst of a, the, the distraction of a, a, a social uh, injustice that were going on, yes, we, we had the opportunity that we could write letters, that we could reach out and we could touch and we could actually reach out and touch and let people know that we are part of the fight, that we are there as Christ has called us to stand up for anything that is wrong and injustice in the world. Yes, the church had become complacent. But we are blessed because God has put us in a transitional period. There's a warning that God put out. He said that if the church of Ephesus did not exist, did not change, then they will be removed from the candlestick. What are you saying, preacher? He is saying that when he removed them from the candlestick, they will cease to exist. As a matter of fact, these seven churches that are listed here, there is only one church which is the Church of Smarter, is the only church that mentioned in this part of the scripture we are talking about, is the only church that still exists today. The rest of the early churches had now been dissolved, have been removed because of sin, because they did not do what God wanted to do. We talk about America great, the America the beautiful, the America, America how wonderful it is, but if we do not change our ways, God will remove us from the candle stand. He will remove us from the place. He will remove us where we will be longer present if we do not take the time to lift up the name of Jesus, if we do not take the time to learn his will in the way, if we do not take the time to exercise an individual what God has a plan in our life, that when we collectively come together, that we be a more powerful force that we may go forth and be what God wants us to be. If we claim we are a nation in God we trust, then we need to exercise that and do what God had called us to do. We need to apply God's teaching in every aspect of our lives, each and every day. When we wake up in our mind, wake up in the morning, it should be Jesus on our mind. We should be seeking him for question and answer that he may lead, lead us. And then we must be able to stand up for what we believe. That if you know that there's evenness in the land, we need to stand up for justice. We need to stand up for righteousness. We need to stand up for godliness. We need to stand up and exercise the love of God. That not, all, not only that we may tear down, but we may also draw in that when people see our lives, they can see the Christ. Christ said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. That if we just trust them, God will. Make a way out of no way. The dangers of a complacent church is a complacent church is a church that's going through the motion without love, without impact, without power. The dangers of a, a complacent church is a church that not being effective, that when it's called upon, it, 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 it don't have compassion, don't have love. But if you have a church that's on fire, if you have a church that that has a passion, you have a church on fire that when they begin to call on the name of God, that things begin to change, that when they begin to move, things begin to happen, that when you have a church that's on fire with the Holy Ghost fire, that when they begin to, to exercise what God had called them to do, you can see a change not only just in the community, but in the whole world. I know a man by the name of Jesus that was born in Galilee. They came and lived 33 and a half long years. And here we are 2,000 years, over 2,000 years later, still talking about the life and the impact that he had as he was able to do the miracle, as he worked within the power that God has given him. He even told us these things and greatest will, will we do in his name. If we just trust and believe in him, he has given us the authority. He has given us the power to do greater things if we just trust him. This same man by the name of Jesus that I'm talking about as he lived 33 and a half long years and he did the great miracles. But one thing he did was he stayed the course. He kept his faith. He walked in God's perfect will. That when he got to the end, when he was spit on and he was rejected, he still walked the perfect will. When he was 
were beat on all night long. He still walked the perfect will. Even though they they put a, a cross on his back and made him walk through the Jerusalem, the streets of Jerusalem, he still walked God's perfect will. When he went up to a hill called Calvary, they put nails in his hand and, and nails in his feet. He still was within God's perfect will. And even when God looked at him, he even turned his back to me, he said, my God, my God, well, why has thou forsaken me? He was still in God's perfect will. When he cried out, Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. He was in God's perfect will. When he, he cried out and dropped his head in the locks of his shoulder and he died on the cross, he was in God's perfect will. But through God's perfect will, early Sunday morning, he got up and declared that all power was in his hand. When he got up, and I'm glad that his perfect will is still not having stopped for him because he's not our mediator. And when we need to call on him, that he's there and available. He is our mediator, goes in and present our prayer, present our request before the Father. And when God see, it, see us now, he see us through the blood of Jesus Christ, that sanctified blood, that cleansing blood, that blood that set us free from the, our sins and therefore we are free and free indeed because of what he done back on Calvary. Now my question that, uh, uh, to you, are you tired of living in his permissive will or do you want to live in his perfect will? If you want to live in his perfect will, take time to learn what God will. Get that passion back. Get that joy back. Get that excitement back about doing God's work. Take time to minister. Take time to reach out. Now, I know we're not able to really come together like we really want to, but we got so many modern technology, many tools that we can use. Use those tools to reach out and touch someone and let someone know that God still loves them, that God still cares. So church, I'm not talking about the building, but churches that I'm speaking to right now, the individual, it's time for you to go back to your first love. Go back to when you was excited by doing God's work. Go back to when you was focused and you wanted to please no one else but God. And if you don't know that, joy, let me introduce you right now. Because there's a law of God that is there waiting to set you free from your sin. And the only thing you have to do is confess it right now. And believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and then not shall be said. And then you start walking and learning. You begin to grow to understand him. You apply your teaching. That as you learn more about Jesus, you apply it in your life that you may become a better Christian. And then you ought to begin to exercise your work. God didn't call us to sit down on the sideline. He called us to get out on the field and do the work. So saints, are you on the sideline or are you doing the work? That is the question. Because if you're on the sideline, you're in the wrong place. Get out and do what God has called you to do. Pray and let God guide you. And don't worry about how strange it is because God already has the answer. And he already has a solution. Just trust him and things will work out. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come right now giving you the praise and honor. We come, Father, lifting you up because you're worthy to be praised. We come, Father, realize it had not been for you, we wouldn't be here. So we honor and bless your name because you're awesome God. You're wonderful counselor, King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, we come right now, Father, asking right now, Father, you may search us right now. Anything not of you, we ask that you will cleanse us. Father, we confess our sin because we realize that we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Father, we realize that you are loving God, that as we confess our sin, that you are able to come in and cleanse us, not just cleanse of what we confess, of, but you are able to cleanse us of what we confess and more. Matter of fact, you are able to get to the real, the real uh, basis of why we in the state we in. Father, we lift up uh, America right now in the midst of the campaign year, Father, you will lead us and guide us, Father. That we may seek you first, Father, and that we may lean to your understanding. Father, we pray right now, right now, for righteousness in the land. We pray for revival in the land, not just for the United States, but for the whole world, Father. We need deliverance in this whole world. Father, we pray for those that are, 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 are 
uh, at the point that they feel like giving up, Father, at the point that they think about suicide, at the point that they are so frustrated, that they are so wound up right now, they are so stressed out, Father, let them know, Father, that joy is just a prayer way. That if they just call on your holy name, Father, that you would deliver them from their from what they're dealing with. We pray right now in the name of Jesus, Father, for deliverance in the name of Jesus. We pray for those who are dealing with financial difficulty right now, lost a job, the economy is in fits right now, Father. In the name of Jesus, Father, we pray right now, Father, that you are just blessed in a mighty way, that you will continue to remind us and help us to look how you keep blessing us over and over again. That, Father, we may not be what we want to be, but, Father, we're still being blessed. Father, we pray for families right now that they may come together and lift up your holy name and trust you right now that you are able. We pray for the young people right now to guide them and lead them, Father. They may be nurtured in the way that you may get the glory. And Father, we pray for our government officials, Father, from the White House all the way down that they may open their eyes and realize that there's a better way. That they will, they will be set free. And Father, we call out those things that are not right with you. Father, we call out those individuals that are fought, that are, that are practicing hypocrisy right now. They say they are Christian, but yet they are not. They say they are of God, but yet they are not. In the name of Jesus, we just bless you and give you the praise. Father, we just want to let you know we love you and we bless your name. And we just want to give you the praise. And Father, we pray for those that are on the front line right now that you would bless them and keep them and sustain them. Father, we just want to give you the glory right now. We just want to bless your name right now. And Father, we just love you. Father, we pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray for the saints of God that they may stand up and fight right now. I'm not asking them to come and fight a physical fight. That they may stand up and fight. That they may get the glory. We have a spiritual fight. That they may fight because we realize that there are evenness in high places. So we are to be dressed with the whole arm of God that we may be able to stand. Father, we just love you and we bless your name. And we give the praise. We pray this prayer in thy son Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray that you continue to go forward. And as you go forward, make sure you continue to speak the word. And exercise, exercise your voice that it may be heard that Jesus is the way. See you next time on Spread the Word. Amen. My heart is troubled. Trouble because somewhere a father is afraid for his kid's life because of gang violence. A mother is concerned that her child may be lost because of drugs. People, the devil is busy. We as Christians must take a stand. Stand up for right. Join in the fight, be a soldier for Jesus. Under a siege of war, your soul you must guard. To be on the winning team, let God recruit your heart. In drug infested streets, Satan makes his attack. Arm yourself with prayer and grace. Try the devil back. Oh my God.